That's looking like it's moving on my side. Well, sorry about that. Are we there? Excellent. Thank you so much. That could have gone on for a while. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So what are we doing today? The first thing I was going to talk about was what we had... Uh, Sitting on this little screen over here. Oh my god, I did all the greets and everything, and no one heard. Oh well. Um, and it was the fact that we've been doing some ambient occlusion experiments, which are clearly wrong. We've got some shadowing here, which doesn't make any sense. Um, we've got little bars here, which are explicitly not meant to be... Uh, meant to, like We have explicit things in there to try and stop that from happening. So obviously we've got something wrong here, so we're going to need to revisit it. Um, one thing I did do off stream was I took out, because I originally thought that I, I was fucking up because I was of the um, tangent space normals. I thought, that's the most likely thing for me to have got wrong. I'll take those out. And I took them out, and we've still got, it's in fact more obvious that we've got problems. Um, so yes, we will have to revisit at some point, but I am not in the headspace to do that today. Um, I kind of really need to sit down and go through everything again, and then we'll do another stream. Um... Yes, but I wanted to let you know I haven't forgotten this and we will come back to it at some point. There's quite a few different things I want to want to get to. Um, other updates, other updates. What have we been doing? We have... Um, I've been doing a little work on the compiler, so I wanted to show you something there because it's just cool. Uh, so I go to tables and core and compile. We've got a little test here. So what we're going to do is we're going to compile a query um, these are the columns that will be going into this query. So assume this is a table with columns A, B, and C. And each of the columns is, has an 8-bit integer uh, for each row. And these are all marked as in and out. So you can read from them and you can write to them. Um, there are no uniforms being passed in this time. Uniforms will be the same as we have in, um, in GLSL. And then here we're doing some random math, just whatever kind of operations just to test they work. And then we are um, writing out. So this is kind of like a named version of values. Um, so it should be reasonably familiar. Here we're saying we're writing Y to the column A. We're writing Z to column B. We're writing A to column C. Column C. And one of the things I was doing recently, I think I mentioned on stream already. Um, whoops, I'm in the wrong place. Well, that's actually okay. Let's do that and go to compile. If I run test, I'm just going to make this not a presentation and put some lines the opposite of that. Put some lines here so we can see what's going on. Cool. Um, so what it's done is it's taken this query and it's split it into three sub-queries. And the reason is that it can, it can work out that each of these outputs, A, B, and C, being written out, are actually independent of each other. They don't use any of the same intermediate values on the way through. Um, to show what would uh, ha show a case where that would be a, would happen, let's have a look. So if we take B and we use X, so A is based on Y, which is X plus one. X is up here. Let's just use X in here. So if I do this and compile, now you can see there are only um, two subqueries because these are kind of intertwined in some way. They rely on the same values. So this is splitting the uh, query into separate things. And the reason we're going to do this is each of these columns is going to be a separate array, essentially. It's going to be unmanaged memory, but it's a, essentially an array. And um, we're going to be running all these things in parallel. So we're going to be kicking these off to different cores, well, different threads, so different cores and all that kind of stuff. And uh, hey, a pump to pimp. And so... Um, Yes, we, we don't want to duplicate work. Also, we're going to have to make sure that we're not um, writing to something someone else is reading from. And so it makes some guarantees to, to make it, for that to be okay. Oh, yeah, so the reason like splitting this thing up makes sense in the first place is that then we're pulling in less data. Um, so we are using our cache better and things like this. So you didn't miss much because I spent the first couple of minutes talking to myself because I didn't have the microphone on. Um, so, yes, what we've got here is... It compiles, all, it compiles some things, splits them into subqueries, and then we run these through the code emitter. So this is this is the start of the fullback uh, code emitter. So the goal, which we will be doing on stream at some point, is to start emitting SIMD instructions. 
but I'm still kind of building up all the stuff towards that. And this is just to start implementing the code generator that will um, just use CFFI. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, there's slightly weird things you can see here. This is something I've been messing around with. Um, I've been looking at uh, one of the things we do have to do when we're when we're making a fallback for the SIMD stuff is that the um, when you're doing addition, subtraction, multiplication with SIMD instructions, they have very defined behavior of what happens when values overflow. And it can be overflowing with uh, saturation, which means essentially clamping at both ends, or it can be wrapping. And we want that same behavior. So we have to be able to do that. Now, so, um, on, um, so all this is doing, this little um, wrap sized um, IOP here, is it's just an 8 bit integer, uh, signed integer operation, and it's doing this. Um, so it's saying that the arguments are both of type signed by 8. Um, it's inlining this wrap signed function, which we'll look at in a second, and then it's doing the multiply and also stating that the output is 8 bits. All of this is going to be, is at, by this point, type checked. So we know that this is the correct thing. Um, to get this wrapping behavior, we've got a few different things. On SBCL, there's actually a function hidden array away called mask signed field, uh, which is super handy in this case because it means um, it's more efficient than doing um, making it ourselves. So then we can say if it's, you know, like 127, then we get 127 back. But when we put in 128, then it's going to be minus 128 because it's wrapped round. So minus 10 is that and minus 200 is 56. So we get this and obviously it works for different bit sizes and things like this. The equivalent for unsigned would be something like um, LDB, which is load byte. And then we're loading eight bit, an 8-bit eight byte from position 0. And you can see again that's, um, that's 56. 10 is 10, 127 is 112. This is, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. This is different, isn't it? Because we're doing with unsigned now. So if we do 255, we're fine. 256, we wrap around, back around to zero. Um, oh, cool, memory haram. I'm glad the video has been helpful, man. Um, and that is actually what we're going to be talking about today, more of the little bits of Lisp videos. Um, Midian, the green screen when the loop stops is really good. Yeah, right? It, it really paid off. I've pushed that into Nineveh now, so that is that is done. And I also tweaked it so it only happens when it's when you leave by um, the stack unwinding, essentially. Um, if you just call stop or anything like that, it's fine. It won't do the black screen thing. So, um, so yes. So we've actually got a few things. I've been doing testing to see what performance is like on different platforms. Um, so... Sorry, not different platforms, different implementations. Very, very early tests. I haven't done much yet. But yeah, this turns out to be the, like obviously this is the fastest way to do it is just using what SBCL gives us. Um, for other ones, I'm having to do, actually the fastest way to do the wrapping here is to do um, the mod implementation. So if I just, um, what should I do? Let me just compile these versions. And if we look at wrap signs, so slap, slime, uh, disassemble symbol boop that is a really fucking long version that's very bizarre okay so that is not oh yeah because okay let, let's do it a slightly different way we'll do disassemble oh i've actually got this left here this is perfect um let's jump into the right package too in i wasn't planning on talking about this but now i am so that's cool um Feel free to shut me up if this is not interesting to you, but let's have a look. So wrap signed, um, 8 bit, and 100. Well, we're going to pass in x, so let's just do that. x is, is a signed byte 8, and we're going to optimize for speed. y is never used. Yeah, we don't need y. There we go. And you can see that even though we're doing um, mod, which is essentially an integer divide, um, SBCL is able to see what's going on and changes it to kind of masks and shifts and things like this. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um, it does the job. Um, this is competitive with this, but this is still noticeably faster over enough iterations. Um, yeah, it gets it gets a bit fiddly. So the um, what's interesting, I think I've got an old version here. One second.
Oh yeah, I have a lot of changes. Let me get those down here. Um, in fact, I'm going to do this. Tables. Yes, so the CCL version is rather different. Um, it does not optimize that mod case well at all. Um, and what ended up being the fastest one is this case here where we... It's really interesting. So oh, yeah, this is actually really handy and I didn't know this. I'll probably do a little bit of list video on this. But normally if we want to write, if we want to print out, sorry, the bits of a number. So let's say, um, yeah, let's say 20, right? We do this. So that tilde B is saying we're printing out in kind of binary representation. Great, right? But if we do minus 20, it does minus the same bits. And that's, uh, it seems a bit weird because that's not the bit re uh, representation of the machine in two's in two's complement um the reason we do like it like this of course is because unless we have infinite precision like we have infinite infinite oh, can we, do you call it infinite precision integers we have infinite size integers that's for sure and so like um in the two's complement notation um you have that that um most significant bit is going to be one and then it's one all the way back so like because these numbers can be any size you can't just have one infinitely off in the distance, so we use minus. I'm explaining that very poorly. I've got to do a better job when I do the little bits of list video, which is why those videos take so long to make compared to how long they actually are. But one thing you can do is we can look at L LDB again. If I do byte 80, let's look at what the documentation says. It says it extracts and returns the byte of um, integer specified by byte spec. Um, it returns an integer, which is the bits uh, with weights, blah, 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 blah. Let's have a look. There's something very important here. Um, oh, does it not mention it? It doesn't mention the two's complement thing, actually. That's really interesting. Okay, so what this is doing, any, actually, what this is doing is it's going to grab... Um, it's going to grab these bits from this number. And if we do that, we can actually see what we expect here. This is minus 20, an 8-bit, um, an 8-bit minus 20. And these are the leading ones that we'd expect. And you can see that it's like the, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of waffling here, but you can see the, re the general idea. Um, so this is super handy. And I just didn't know that before. And, so then if you wanted to take the 16 bit minus 20, it's like this and so on. Um, but yes, of course, that means once you've got it, once you take the LDB, it's actually going to be positive. Um, so yes, you have to do some work to get it back again. And this is what ends up, ends up happening here. We're having to do a bunch of shifting around and stuff like this to try and get it um, to grab the appropriate bits and then get it back into the negative representation. It's a bit of a hoo-ha, uh, but we use deposit. Um, we de use deposit byte and put the leading bit back in, which then makes it negative. And it's whew. big num is what you call them. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, we just call them integers, don't we? I think. I think the like the. Or is actually big num the type? That would be really interesting. Actually, I don't know that. Um, let's have a look. Glossary B. Okay, so we don't specify them as big nums. I think it's just that basically integers and ratio have that kind of infinite precision. Uh, yeah, it's also worth noting whenever you're doing these kind of uh, logical operations that um, yes, on their arguments that are treated as if they were binary. Um, negative integers are treated as if they were in two's complement notation. Now, obviously, for most of the machines you're on, they are in two's complement no notation. Well, I mean, yeah, it could be being represented by an object. You don't know. So there's all kinds of things going on there. Uh, but it's just worth knowing that. Right. So, yes, I've been basically I've been doing a lot of dickering around with. Um, oh, what the fuck? With. Uh, yeah, sized integers and their wrapping and things like this and trying to find out what goes quick. Well, quick enough for our needs because we need a fallback that's not complete garbage. Um, 
So yes, that is where our compiler is. I've got to keep doing work on this. So the next step is um, I need to emit the correct code for output, um, which is just going to be set f. Um, we've also got to pass in, so we're passing in um, pointers a and c. So these are source, you can kind of think of this as source a and source c. We're also gonna to have to pass in the pointers for destination um, a and destination c. And the reason those might be different is because when we run these queries, the way I want it to work is that it's treated like a transaction and everything that's reading sees the tables that they're reading from as they were at the beginning of the transaction. But of course, all of this, there's a lot of mutation going on and it's going on concurrently. So you don't know when those values are gonna change. So there's an implicit double buffering that goes on. When it's reading from one buffer, it's writing into another buffer. And then we point a swap to like apply those changes to the table. Um, what that means is that yes, the destination might be different from the source. Of course, if there's nothing else reading from the column that you're trying to write to, there's no need to do this. And we can just have A and destination A be the same pointer and we go from there. Um, so yes, yeah, lots of details to work out and I'm going to work out the kind of the main loop that churns all over, over all this stuff and the job system and a few other bits and then we should be able to do some stuff. I'm thinking it's a couple of months away, I expect maybe three months, um, depending on how life goes in, the next, in that period of time. Oh, it's super busy at the moment, guys. It's really cool. So anyway, that's the compiler update. Um, I've been waffling on for a while. We want to get on to the actual business of the day, which is, um, yeah, making some tutorials. I, I want to do, I, I've had this in my head for ages, and it's really getting to me at the moment, especially with all my lovely Patreons, kind of when the month comes around and that, that uh, those donations come in, which I'm super grateful for, thank you so much. Um, it really reminds me I need to make more videos. And one of the series I wanted to do for a while is on CFFI. We did that big two hour video, but it was kind of, yeah, it, it, it was a bit all over the place and it was focusing on um, working with a foreign library, which is primarily what this is for. But I really wanna do some videos approaching this like um, we approach kind of teaching other parts of um, Lisp in general, which is kind of from simpler principles. So I wanna start, um, actually right down here um, with allocating foreign memory. So I want us to talk about that kind of stuff. So this is really just brainstorming and working out what we're going to do. Um, thank you everyone for the links referenced as big num here in the CL cookbook. Good stuff, let's have a look. Yes. Oh, okay. Shut my face, it is big num. Huh, why wasn't that in the glossary? Oh no, because the glossary is terms. If we'd gone to symbol index, maybe it would have been in here. Big num, there we go, of course. Right, that was it, nice. It's an integer and it's not a fixed num. Cool. Oh, thanks for that. That's, uh, sorry, who linked that again? Um, Telepool, thank you. Yes. Yeah, any size integer, really cool. And the fact that we've got proper ratios as well, so nice. Right, anywho, what shall we do? Um, yeah, let's just bring ourselves up. Let's, let's make a little project. That's what we're gonna do. Um, slime set. Default directory, just make sure it's in the right place. I'm gonna put it in Lisp. And a quick load, quick project. We're gonna quick project, make project, and we are gonna make CFFI notes. And we're going to quick load CFFI notes, and we're gonna go there. So let's go to there now. And I'm going to say depends on Oops, CFFI. And I like calling this file base to start with because I don't like having two files with the same damn name other than the extension. 
when I'm starting out because it just slows me down. Cool. Um, let us get to that then. Let's see if we find notes. All right. So the first thing, how are we going to approach this? Um, I suppose we could like try and work out like the kind of flow. So the, the place I'm very adamant about starting is I want to talk about um, allocating memory. I want to talk about what foreign memory is. Um, yep. And I want to talk about it in terms, like I, I really want to divorce this from the language we're interfacing with. It's obviously C and the manual talks about C all the time. I think you can also interface with D with it. But um, that's not really the bit that's interesting. I actually, when I first started using CFFI, I knew very little C. I'd done kind of like Hello Worlds and exercises and stuff like this, like your basic calculator and all that crap. But I knew essentially no C. So CFFI, my first experience with that was trying to use it in conjunction with um, CL OpenGL. I was like, okay, right? I knew what pointers were, but I just wanted to, yeah, start doing things with this. Um, so I don't think that knowing C is like mandatory uh, for starting this. So we don't want to talk about what foreign memory is. I, we definitely want to need to talk about the fact it's um, unmanaged. So we're going to be talking about freeing things. I suppose, oh yes, of course, wait a second. I'm an idiot. There we go. wonder why I was doing that. Um, I'm so used to doing all my notes in Lisp files, even when it's not a Lisp thing, just so I can, if I need to compute something, I, I have it there like a calculator. So it confuses me when I'm typing, like, why is the formatting wrong? So yeah, I managed freeing, I suppose in a way we can talk slightly sideways about Lisp um, and the GC, just to really say that it's there um, and why that might matter to us, why that we can't just hand over that memory to I guess, yeah, that's an important thing. If we're talking to these other libraries, we can't just, like the garbage collector needs to be able to move things around. And that's no good if we're passing off a reference to someone else to, to be able to look at that data. Now, by doing that, we're already talking about references or pointers. So we're gonna need to introduce those in a way. So they're gonna need to come in very early. I mean, they obviously are in a way because I mean, so if we start with CFFI, we've got foreign alloc. Um, let's just, yeah, look at this. So it's obviously foreign alloc, so it's kind of doesn't bear repeating, I suppose. But um, I suppose the real thing I want to get across here is that you're making a place. Um, Put data, I suppose. Because it's not about, you're not making an object, you're not making an, an integer, you're not making an array of integers. You're making enough space for something to be there. Um, you're asking the operating system, hey, give me this region where I can put things. Um, we do specify a type, but we do so to tell it how much space we need. So if we say um, int eight and then count 15 is enough space to store 15 of these. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to put those there. And that's something I definitely want to get across early. Um, so let's just bring this down. So this mandates us to start talking about types as well very soon and I don't want to go on about it for too long at the beginning um, I would like to be able to introduce as few as things as possible um, before we get into allocation because it's the, the most important thing is about hey we're gonna try and get some space to store stuff I really want to, one of the things I actually want to show is that like, let's take, let's just take that memory we just allocated. So def var temp zero, that, right. Um, let's do setf memoref cfi memoref 
um, temp zero type is an um, int 32 and let's just start with the float and we're going to put 1.2 in there right and then we're going to go into that same spot and we're going to read from it but we're going to read it as an int 32 and it's important for people to know that that's okay it might be surprising but that's completely we need to get across that that is valid that's not a that's not a trick that's just like hey when you're writing and reading you're telling it how to interpret what is at that place so i suppose very like like here we're going to have to pretty much immediately talk about pointers i'm not sure like how deep do we have like how deep do we have to go and the, the, we've got to be a little careful because i mean it is just a number that um it's kind of the address of the memory that we've allocated right but the, the reason i'm a little interested in here is that we also have the term pointer address right which gets us the yeah gets us the address as a number um to gets us the pointer as a number as an address and so i don't want to say that the pointer is the address when we then have something that gets the address from a pointer you know um zuluino is saying pro tip to anyone because it tripped me up before generally you should favor mem a ref over mem ref mem a ref takes an offset uh, but that offset is in bytes which is pretty much always useless yeah that's it's really interesting so we'll have to um Yes, that actually fits in pretty well. So we want to get as fast as possible to this point where we're allocating some memory and we're getting the 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 pointer. So it's 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 uh, yeah. So don't want to use the term address um, as overloaded with pointer address, and that's just going to confuse people. Because we won't be able to go into details on nomenclature. Um, let's do the dumb thing and just look at what a pointer is according to Wikipedia. I, I want to know what their thing is. It's an object that stores the... Me oh, here we go. Perfect. Actually, this is, this is what we need. So this is just a weakness in my own knowledge, really. It's funny, isn't it, how you can be super familiar of working with things? But your brain stored it in a completely non-linguistic way. It's one of those evidences of like, yes, just because you can't say a thing doesn't mean you don't feel it or understand it. Um, What do they say is memory address then? Is a reference to a specific memory location used by values. Um, okay. So I think we'll actually use these pretty much as is, because they're almost perfect for our needs, um, because they're so nice when something is actually written really clearly. Um, I'm not going to put another here. And the reason I'm not going to do another is it makes it it draws extra attention to, like it makes you, like when, when you have another or something, you're trying to think of it as opposed to, like what if this is another, what was the former, you know? And even though it's kind of obvious that it's a pointer is, is an object and therefore it exists somewhere as well. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't kind of want to get into that right now. And so we can loosen this up just a little. 
to help people understand at the expense of a tiny bit of accuracy. Um, I was just saying, cool to see CFFI from the ground. I know you used it a lot with other projects, but getting it from scratch for us is really cool. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, this has been burning, like, because time's at a premium, and I'm trying to do, like, set up the projects so we have some fun SIMD stuff to do for the stream. And I got, um, CF, uh, sorry, Keppel and, uh, I think it's mainly Keppel. Keppel and Nineveh have both got updates now that will be going out in the next quick list release. That was another thing I did in the last week. Um, so yes, like uh, I, re I really wanted to do more videos. Um, this is a good. I, I, I had a point, and I can't remember where it's gone. Okay, so we want to say okay. So we're we're going to be dealing with um, dealing with foreign memory. It's unmanaged, which means it's not. Um, which means we're going to request to have a space to put things. And we're going to request for that space to be disposed when we're done with it. Um, and this is just a. Uh, just opposed? Is that the word? Yeah, it's just opposed against. Um, the behavior we're used to coming from common lisp which we we have to treat as our default going into this we're going to assume basic common lisp understanding and then we're just going to work from there um now is it worth pointing out that like if you make something like you've got a chunk of memory and you're saying dispose it, you dispose it with the pointer to the head, right? You're not, you don't just take a pointer to the middle of that chunk that you've allocated and say, hey, dispose this, um, and it frees it. You know, it doesn't free that. So we could say, like, explain that there is obviously some bookkeeping going on. But yeah, I don't know. I think that's too much too soon. I think it might be something we want to kind of let people like if we if we can slip it in completely subtly like so it's a, a kind of throwaway comment that they can just glance off because what we don't want is to distract too much so maybe mention os bookkeeping it would be good to actually mention that when you're doing this you are making a request to the os that's very kind of fundamental And I, well, that's interesting, actually. I assume that we're using um, malloc fairly directly. It could be that it's just being given to us, like, sub-allocated out of some chunk that the implementation has. I'm not sure if it has to be, according to CFFI. CFFI is, it's like a manual rather than a specification, I think. So... Oh, that's a good point. Like, wh what what CFFI is? Um, see, I don't want to get, get too top heavy, though. We don't want to load too much stuff on the front before we're actually doing something in the wrapper because you lose people so quickly with that. Um, but we want to say that it's a wrapper around um, functionality that already exists in um, the various implementations of CL. Okay, so we've now, we've designed about 30 seconds of a video, maybe. <laughs> if these are all the same video, we might split these up. Um, if you can bear with me just one second, I want to make sure I've got the coffee machine off where I've been left that bubbling away. Right. Thanks for not trashing the place while I was gone. Um, oh yeah, here's something I definitely won't be talking about anytime early in the, t the tutorials. Strings. Because strings are fucking complicated types. 
Strings and booleans are two of the most complicated types that are put in languages by default. I think a wasp has got in. Little fucker. One second. I hate wasps. God damn you. Ugh. Get out. Alright. Not hello little wasp. Fuck little wasp. I hate wasps. Love bees. Love bees. Hate wasps. Um, right, okay. Where do we get to? So yes, not strings. And um, actually, when, when we want to talk about the types that are around here. Um, types. Um, defining new types and all that kind of stuff. Let's just look for give me an ape. Yeah, I want to introduce these. We will we will do a video where we introduce most of these. But I definitely want to start with ones with um, very definite behavior. And by that I'm gonna mean the sized ones. So these guys. Um, yeah. And of these, we don't even really need to talk about most of them. So it will be good to point out the difference between the signed and unsigned ones. And so I think we can get away with 8-bit, 32-bit floats and double. At least then we're, like, we're doing things in pairs, you know? And then we can talk about the other stuff later on. And the reason I want to do 32-bit as well as 8-bit is for this exact reason here, because I want us to do a little demonstration. In fact, let's look for that now. Uh, floating point down. Um, what is the a bitwise IEEE floating point standard single position NAN would be? Where S is the sign and X sequence represents a non zero number. First bit from X is used to determine the type of the NAND. So I'm kind of interested in just, let's, let's go to IEEE floating point. Let's look for NAND in here and just see if we can get an example of the NANDs. So I suppose this actually covers a number of bit sizes. So I kind of want, want a, um, IEEE 754.32-bit now, just an example of one. I'm normally so good at generating them when I write shader code. I thought I would have been able to find one now. Um, oh, so maybe it's all... Oh, that's cool. Um, This is one of the reserved bit patterns of the special values of QNAN, quiet another number. So it's just saying that all ones. Well, that's cool. Let's do this. Uh, format, because I never remember this kind of stuff off the top of my head. I always have to look. See that wasp floating around outside again, little bastard. So, yeah. So if we took this number, 
which makes sense. And we did our set f again, but we wrote it in as a um, un32. And then we read it again as a float, we get quiet down. And this is the, one of the things I want to talk about is just being able to show that yeah, it is actually like it's, it's a valid thing to do. And these rep like the same thing in memory is going to represent two different things, completely valid things, depending on how you read stuff. Uh, unique persona. Hello. Um, wasps are good for removing garden pests. I'm sure there's something else that's good at removing garden pests, though, as well. It's got to be something I can replace a wasp with. Not as bad as hornets, though, I'll give them that. Um, Zula Inno is saying CFI has a bunch of type translator system that I've never made use of I'm playing with it right now but that might be oh I'd love to cover that because I, I don't understand it well enough either which means I'll have to do it to um, to be able to teach it so I'm going to just drop this down here because I want to get this in at some point as well um, so the first time we cover types these are the types we're going to cover um, so we're going to do it in the context of another lesson. Um, yeah, let's just drop these here. I'm not sure when this is going to come into play. Uh, first types we will talk about. Um, and I'm going to do these six because we can talk about these ones give us different, different variations in size. We get to show that we have signed and unsigned, and that matters. And then we have float, which is interesting. I mean, we could just do this, but it seems nice to have a pair, seeing as we've been everything else has been pairs of things. Um, and then we'll do the other types later on. Uh, oh yeah, pointer would be the other type actually that we really should. So maybe we take out double and we talk about pointer. Um, not sure about that. Or maybe we just have to do seven. The first types we will talk about are these. Um, it's kind of interesting that I wonder if the manual addresses why those are keywords. So let's look at keyword. Um, enums which we'll get to another time or later in the series um, default foreign encoding well that's interesting guess for strings strings are way too complicated just so complicated god damn it fuck them right define foreign library we'll definitely get to that eventually as well but it's by the time you get there a lot of that stuff becomes fairly easy it's just grokking the basics of actually working with foreign memory and stuff like this is the really important bit that I want to get across. Okay, so we're allocating memory. We're making a place that we can store things. And we, we're we not um, dictating what can be in there. We're saying, give me enough space that I could put 15 ints, um, 15 8 bit ints. Um, but yeah, that doesn't restrict what we can do there. We get a pointer back and we don't need to have that warning now because we've got this. Um, so when we allocate, we should actually talk about the address first. Um, so you allocate, and that's going to have a position in memory somewhere. And we talk about where it is as its address. So it's kind of like talking about where a house is, is it street? Um, but a pointer is an object that stores a memory address with a value. And that's really cool. So at some point we'll get, we'll come back to that. But that at least, um, yeah, we can probably say that an address is a number. Um, We probably don't need to go into too much more than that. And then this pointer is a special object. 
that stores the address and we can do stuff with it. Nick Persona saying, I see you are doing an outline as comments in source. I came across um, this out org thing that allows you to edit comment blocks as org. Cool. Yeah, I mean, org mode is one of those things that I've never got around to looking at. I know everyone sings about it as being the best thing, um, but yeah. I, I find so much that I just, yeah, doing block comments gets me quite far. But that is cool to know. That's really good. So okay, so we're going to get them to that point where they can start allocating things. And then, like... <sighs> we need to talk about size of stuff and what types mean to us in this case. Yeah, let's actually look, let's go back to, go back to here and... Uh, Type in C language. Let's have a look at this. Data types. How do they talk about their types? Static and weakly typed makes it similar to blah blah blah. Um, so let's just cancel this. Yeah. interested to see if their definition of type um, is something useful here so we can't go too fundamental but if we can do it in the if I really want to get it just like the different values take up different sizes. I'm trying to work out like the order of the terminology. How do I want to talk about that? So I suppose it's just saying different types. I mean, type is so familiar that we can almost say it as a kind of, I don't know. We can always use it incorrectly. Um, but yes, yeah, so when we're reading and writing to these things, um, we specify, we're specifying the type, which is really telling it how to um, interpret the value it finds there. So when we're writing, we're saying, hey, here's this float, like, um, like store that. Because that's one of the things, what I don't want to do and be confusing is do this, right? Because that's a bug. Because with the kind of terminology I'm using, it, it would be easy to say, oh, so he's saying this is basically how the thing, um, could that be mistaken? I'm, wonder, I'm worried if, if we say this wrong, it gives the impression that this is the interpretation of the memory and then we're just passing in any value and it kind of handles it. So we can just say that this is how it's like how you're interpreting the value in question. So the value in question when you're setting is the one that's being passed, that's being written. Um, and then when you're getting, it's the the bits in memory, uh, that value there, how to interpret those bits when you're reading. So but that makes it sound very detached from um, type in the normal case, I suppose. Let's look at type system. To, so a data type, here we go. Or simply type is an attribute of data which tells the compiler or interpreter how the program intends to use the data. It's an attribute of data, something about the data. Data type constrains the values that an expression Yes. So we're talking about its representation as much as anything else. And we are going to be talking about the bits. So I'm just trying to work out in my head 
how much we need to go into this. I think I might leave that open for now and come back to it. Um, Pond of him saying, yeah, the, I, I have the little typer around. I think I have it. Uh, nope, I don't have it on my desk at the moment. Um, so, yes. With, yeah, like... A, so yeah, the little typer will give us a very academic description, probably a very useful one. Um, it might give us some. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. But we also don't want to get too academic, right? Like we don't want to. We don't want to confuse anyone. We don't want to distract anyone from the actual business that we're here for but it's seen as we're making the tutorial it's on us to uh yeah to do our best to get things across well um wow let's see is there actually a definition here Type eight. There you go. Atom is a type. Type, type, type. Doesn't say what a type is, though. It's actually quite cool because it's kind of, kind of to constructively like build up some information here. Um, it just kind of slips that terminology in. Okay, so I don't want to dig into that too long, but yeah, so that. Yeah, we all know the idea. We don't know how to express it. Yeah, it's like. There's expressing it precisely and then there's expressing it well for the situation. And this is why these videos take fucking ages. Because um, I get really anal about this stuff. Because I don't like introducing a term that we leave hanging. Because I'm really bad at remembering stuff. So I, I kind of like to get a piece of information and hook it somewhere. right? So it stays there and then the new information I can relate to these things. If I'm holding on to loads of stuff, I struggle really quickly. Um, yeah. So, what is, um, seeing as we're dealing with common lisp, what does it say a type is? Glossary entry. Because we probably should lean on this a bit. A set of objects. Ah, right. Okay, so we might want to distinguish. Yes, in common list, it is a set of objects. And it might be an infinite set of objects. Um, how much does that apply in languages like C? Um, I know it's really, you know, saying, oh no, do not bring the CL type system into this. Yeah, I know, but it's like, wh wh where are they going to come from? Where is the thing? So. Um, we can say that types are the representation of a value. Um, the type describes the representation of a value. Um, ooh, yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky because we've got representation and also the set of possible values. Is one implicit from the other? Um, Slash interpretation bits. Interpretation. So yeah, we'll have to come back to that one. That's fine. We're just finding all the things we need to deal with. All right, so let's assume that we managed to introduce, like, eh, we've got some types and all that kind of stuff. All things are going well. Let's just jump through to foreign types. Like, we introduce what a type is. We introduce a few of these basic types. Um, 
here we're actually going to use foreign alloc and i think we should do foreign free as well because then we've closed that cycle um allocating memory freeing memory um and that's just that is cfvi foreign free and it takes a pointer and we're just com complete saying that it's given it back to the os so making a place so asking the os for a place to put the data we don't make space the space is there we're asking for it we're saying hey you please can we have some enough for this um we use this little diversion to talk about things being places and then we jump straight back to pointers which are the things we're actually interested in and then when we do this we get to see a pointer um we talk about freeing and really that to me feels like a video right there that is probably that's at least five minutes um it, like taking your time and getting through everything that's probably a five minute video um that might be quite fast actually it might be a seven minute video um we could split this out but i don't think that's necessary i think we try and get through this as fast as possible because it doesn't matter whether it was defined by the standard or not as long like for, for now because everything we're doing is portable um it is actually it obviously is important what it is um but yes okay so we're gonna like um our first few types um so we're gonna look at these We're going to come up with a, a, an explanation that is satisfactory. Um, we are going to um, revisit. Um, I think, ooh, it's kind of annoying, isn't it? Because an int 8 is, might not be something people have heard of, but if you say byte, or do, do they not have byte? They don't have byte. Well, shut my face. Okay. You can't have bite. Never mind. Yeah, so that works. So, so we'll do you in eight. Um, there's not another alloc, is there? No. Or an array alloc. Okay. Is that when you pass in an array and it gives you an equivalent one? Yes, okay. So you, yeah, you do like, I don't know. One, whoops, one, two, three, and you say the array type is of, you know, int eight. Is that on there? Oh no, because it's gonna be an, I'm an idiot. Okay, so it's gonna be the array type. So it's gonna be something like this, probably. Valid number of arguments, one. What the fuck are you talking about? That's interesting. Wow, that's a really bad error. Huh. So that was the actual definition. Shows how good my memory is. Um, yeah, we should improve that error message in CFFI at some point. Okay, that's a to-do. Um, Mask. 
here is a confusing error. Should probably report that. Cool. Or just fix it. And we'll make a pull request. Um, cool. That's good. So we're going to introduce some types. Um, now, what's a nice way of looking at some of this stuff? Suppose we don't worry about that too much. Let's just get into the point where we're we're allocating some memory again. Um, so we talk about some types. We talk about what this is. This order will probably switch, and then we just get into the business of allocating some memory um, and. You went 32 and count is 10. Um, and then, yeah, actually just setting, so setting a value. Setting a value and reading a value. Yeah. And I think if we do that a couple of times with different things, that would be enough for a single video. Um, sorry, I'm going to jump back into chat now. I've got a little distracted there. Um, my favorite type is satisfies eval. Holy shit, I hadn't even thought of that. Is that, is that legit? Oh, man. A type is like a level of, of description of like a musical scale. Man, you confuse me. Um, you never used the array type. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> you bet your ass it's legit. Yeah, that's that's scary, man. Like satisfies is oh, man, it's cool. It, it's like uh, I really want to do like a dependently typed like a decent dependently type system. Um, dependently type type system in um, CL. And have a nice kind of static subset. Um, I'll get to that another day. <laughs> I'm not not quite ready to dive into the dependent stuff yet. I really want to, but I'm just like, yeah, my brain will melt. Okay, so this is um, so a note on types. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do this example here, and we're going to do it a few different ways, I think. So we're just going to go on about the point that when you have some memory, you can store things in it. Um, oh, I, I can think of another example that'll actually be a good one. So let's do. Um, let's do. Let's take temp zero again. I want to set a mem a ref. Um, Oh yeah, see if I am a ref uh, temp, and we're going to do a uint eight. And we're going to put ten there, and we're going to do this at index zero. And then we'll also do write it twenty into index one, and then we'll show that we can get those back. All right. But then we can also show that this is legal, right? Yes. Because then we can do something like format nil. And this is why I'm doing unsigned in, because it makes some of this just a little, little easier when poking around. Um, so we can do 10. Yeah, let's do this. 10, 20, 51, 30. So then it's being able to see that we have our Am I reading that 
right? Oh yeah, 10, 20, yes. So our 10. That's right, yeah. Our 10 and our 20, and then 51, 30 is those bits. So yeah, it's, I suppose it's just worth pointing that stuff out. Um, I should probably have done that in a different order. So if we did 51, 30 first, and then we did 20, and then we did 10, I think that would have been easier to match up what was going on. So then we could have said, this is our eight bits, three, four, five, seven, eight, whatever. Yeah, we can see that we've got the same thing. So I think that'll be a nice kind of example to go along with this. So it'll be an episode on representation. Um, hey, Jace. Just saying, feel quite silly, but I honestly totally forgot it was Wednesday. I, uh, it, and even if I had remembered that I wasn't watching the clock. Yeah, I mean, oh, you are so good. You've just reminded me of a thing. I would like to change the stream time to be one hour later. So I, I can do from 9 till 11 my time. How does that work for you folks? Would that be mean any of you don't get to see it? Um... Does that make it easier for anyone? Yeah, um, I'd love to, I'd love to hear your opinions on that. Please shout up, even if you're just a lurker, because I really care about whether you get to see it or not. Um, but yeah, it would actually. Uh, Point of people saying one hour better is way better for me. Better doesn't affect me at all. Doesn't affect me at all. Should be okay. That bodes well. Um, that's great. All right, so I'm going to tentatively say that next from next week we're going to start doing nine till eleven. That works. That works quite well for here as well. That's cool. Tallulah so Paul is saying, in fact, it's probably be better as I'm heading back to the UK at the end of June. Oh, cool, man. Right. So, what I think we'll do now, seeing as we're on the, we, we've kind of gone allocate some stuff, um, talk about some types, talk about representation. I think it'd be quite good now to jump into. Well, it's two things. I think we, we could do a quick one on. I suppose we could. We we've been using meme ref. And we've kind of just had people accept it. We we're like we're going to start off just saying like, "Hey, this is how you access. This is how you access memory, right? This is how you access foreign memory." And then we can say we can go into more detail on it later. It would be good to do an episode on memref itself and talk about because they're going to find it, it's not going to be long before they mistype and do memref so it's probably a good idea if we address that early on um yeah like you say like it it's not normally something you need but it's um yeah it's good to have around i suppose And then with that, we've got quite a few bits. Is there any other, see if there's not any other kind of. Mem A pointer. Ooh. See, that's interesting. They would be quite good to put together in an episode. But. If we're going to look at Mem A pointer, then we really need to talk about the fact that we're kind of like. Kind of not really dealing with arrays. Um, oh, sorry to hear that, Jace. Connection's not playing right. Yeah, I wish I could blame me, but my slides are actually stable at the moment. So, um, yeah. Sorry about that, man. Yeah, so meme ref, mem ref. Do we do meme pointer? Or 
Or do we even need to mention arrays right now? We probably don't. No, we can probably get by. Let, let's tentatively leave that there for now. I'm not sure of the... I'm not super happy with this position in the order of lessons right now, but we'll we'll come back to it. Um, first man a pointer we need to talk about arrays. Okay, so with that done, what I would actually like to do is talking about um, locally allocating stuff. So CFFI with foreign object. Um, right, so then we get, we're saying like temp is, you know, our uint8, our 10 uint8s, whatever. Print temp, and we have our pointer, and then we'll do some things with that. And um, we're gonna need to give a really big warning Warning! Um, that the like do not hold on to this pointer. And I I got reminded uh, about that lesson just the other day because it turned out that um, in Keppel we had a case where that was being done and it was temporarily okay um, in in SBCL. But in CCL, when a pointer goes out of scope, they actually tag it as as like a garbage pointer. So that when I was trying to access it again, it was causing a problem. But it's funny because all the tests I had for this were passing just fine with SBCL. And um, that makes sense for SBCL just to use a fucking regular pointer. I mean, it's as little fluff around it as possible. Um, but yeah, that was that was an interesting catch. And it, it was just a... Um, I had a, what did I have? I had a pointer to, yeah, it was, it was just, um, yeah, I just, I just had a, a pointer to an object and then gone out of scope. Um, for the uint8 printing format, nil. Ah, thank you very much. That's actually going to help a lot. Right, so then if we go back to our stuff here, right, we can do now This is tricky. What's the least confusing way of doing it? <laughs> Do we just do this three times? Which is kind of gnarly looking. Or do we do this, which is, well, not much better in that case. Oh yeah, that's not gonna work, is it? Because like we're, it's not 8-bit. Um, that actually confused me, what the fuck? Sixteen bit, eight bit, eight bit, five one three zero twenty ten. But then at least we should be able to go. Hey, we can see that this is this, and that this is this, right? So that is good. Nice. Thanks for Maria. Um. Uh, the old IT wisdom saves me again. Um, so yeah, I can't even keep audio only going. Wow, definitely something screwy going on. Treat, try restarting the app, and if that doesn't work, oh, so it's actually okay now. Uh, it looks ugly in format stream, but the result is good. 
Yeah, thanks for catching my silly 8-bit mistake as well. Um, but yes, this... Um, that would be cool. We could even do... Oops. We did this, which makes it look uglier. Then it's kind of fun because we can do this on the stream and it makes it really obvious what's going on rather than just my kind of search highlighting. Wait, what the fuck? Oh God, it's so confusing reading it. Because I keep reading this as an individual kind of token. Blah. I don't know. Uh, just saying, someone mind telling me what the scheduling idea was? I got the gist of it, but the actual alternate time was lost to me. One hour later, so um, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. my time. And then, yeah, just the current hour shifted by one. Um... Guess you should do a little bit of list videos on format before CFFI. I've done some basic stuff, but I really, I'm really not ready to get into this kind of gnarliness. Oh, sorry, this kind. I can't even read it. God damn, that's nasty. No, I'm not going to do that on the stream. It's too confusing to look at. That'll have to do. It's such a shame. Why is this like, ugh? Wait a second. We could do. Um... No, that doesn't give you 16 bits, though. Fucking hell. Nope. Oh, man. Nasty. Anyway, we'll go with this. This is fine. So, yeah, we want to talk about um, with foreign objects. So then it's, um, it's obviously very natural to do... Really? Fine. If we're doing this, then we should also do with foreign objects. So this is kind of the uh, let starry kind of a oh, well, yeah, it's, it's just like a proper let. So foo and bar, and it's a float. So we allocated one float with room for one float and room for ten uint eights, um, and then we can do foo. Don't, I never understand why that happens. Um, bar. It can also be interesting to look at this and notice that um, these numbers are like the difference between this and this is eight. Is eight. Never mind then. Yeah. What am I not seeing there? Oh yeah, that's fine. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, that is fine. But yeah, sorry, the, the actual point was to do, oh, fuck, really? This one. So you want to show that we can do this as well. Ba, 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 ba. Chase is saying, could use um, tilde slash. Probably alignment nonsense. 16 pad Charles zero to escape the character to be printed. I have no clue what. <laughs> uh, yeah. Comma zero to escape the character. Yeah, format is really versatile. It's like one of those just like. I remember just being like, what the fuck when I first saw it? But I mean, I guess the only way I explain it. You see, no, I mean, every language has something goofy. Uh, but yeah. I just love that the formatters can be compiled. I like with a macro. That's so nice. 
Um, anyway, what am I doing? One thing I want to have in this series somewhere is rather implementation specific. Um, but it's just to note the... Um, when these macro expand, they're going to get reduced to something very specific. Like, like the when the implementation knows the type at compile time, it can often optimize into something like... Yeah, that's exactly what you were after. Um, so yeah, like a mem a ref turns into a mem ref uh, with the actual number of bytes, and then that turns into something else. It's funny that that turns into an unsigned short at that point. I guess they're the same side. Um, that's actually one point. When we do get around to doing this stuff, where would these, I, I guess these lengths are Okay, these types correspond to the native C integer types according to the ABI of the Lisp's implementations host system. Yes. Okay. So you don't actually like this. These sizes are not going to be stable across all platforms, whereas these ones will be. Um, but most of the time, the software that you're interacting with is going to be um, using these. So these are obviously very important. But still, yeah. Blah. Which has been mean to you, man. I have no idea how to explain this in a sensible way. Yes, so another thing we really need to talk about is again is related to types and it's about the fact that because we're using a dynamic language the types aren't like we're not compiling ahead of time and we don't track the, the so the types don't get tracked around what am i saying we don't have a static type system so the ffi type information is not known so when we have something like this get across I want to get across the fact that between here and here oh fuck you divide notes memo ref is undefined what did I do oh yeah because all these need to be CFFI Right, so the point is that between here and here, we didn't remember the type. Between here and here, we didn't remember the type. We're in a dynamic. Yeah. We want to get that across at some point. Um, so that's a video in it, kind of in itself, just talking about that thing. Um, Yeah, we do actually need to talk about using these chunks as um, as arrays, you know? Um, let's have a look. Man, audio only for this isn't gonna make, <laughs> isn't gonna make the most sense. I'm such a, I'm just kind of randomly gibbering. Okay, so let's have a look. 
So people are looking to... Yeah, there's lots of stuff to do with the format string going on in the chat. There's also... Let's bring this up. Um, Zulu Inno is saying, I'm doing heavy CFFI right now. Part of that was defining a new CL declaration for CFFI pointer type, which what which then a macro can use to avoid heavily repeating the type in 50 places. Um, I think like you were saying about uh, submitting that to um, CFFI, I think those things are cool. Um, I actually believe that they make a lot of sense as companion, like as libraries alongside um, CFFI. It's cool. Um, yeah, I would be surprised if that's... Um, I would be surprised if that was accepted, but I think it's an excellent thing for a library in QuickLisp. Um, and th in fact, I think it's better that way because then it, like, you're able to evolve it in kind of more sensibly alongside what's happening. Kind of like that. Oh boy. Oh, this is a big article on how format works. Oh, good grief. Look at all this. Bloody hell. Too much. I can't do that right now. Um, nice. Yeah, I think Zulawena, there's also um, C Star, isn't it called? It was something that was shipped along with um, Auto Wrap. And they, they have a... Oh, no, but that's completely separate. They're using their own system there. Yeah, auto wrap and... What's the one that Borrow Dust maintains now that's awesome, but... Yeah, but separate from CFFI in itself. I can't remember. Claw. Claw, that was it. Zulu in it says, I know auto wrap has CLET, but it's not exactly that. Oh, interesting. Cool. Maybe we can convince baggers to use, to, use, to use impatient mode in Emacs. What's impatient mode? Impatient mode Emacs. No. I see HTML. I'm already unhappy. Okay. Right. Claw. Yes, that was Claw. Ninjured. Haha, <laughs> I beat you. Right, so where else are we now? So we, we've kind of talked about um, kind of global allocation and then local allocations and stuff like this. Um, what would be a nice other thing to do now? Um, yeah, we really need to talk about arrays. In fact, it's probably going to be before um, this stuff, but. Foreign arrays. And this is how I want to introduce foreign arrays. Is basically, you've already done it. Like, if you've done memaref, you've got memaref and you've got foreign, um, foreign allocate. But, but, then you already have um, you already have arrays. Um, so yeah, we're, we're making ten of these, and so we can just do this and let's just do this over here. Mem a ref. Oh. CFI mem a ref. Blah blah blah. blah, blah. And then we just need to explain that in uh, in in CFFI um, arrays are what's the correct term for that again? They're tightly packed. There's what's the oh for God's sake! It's such a simple term as well. Um,
Patient mode saves an Emacs buffer in real time over HTTP would allow us to see and copy paste the text directly. Oh, funny. Cool. Contiguous, thank you. Contiguous. That is not how you spell that word. Continuous? That is also not what I was going for. Have they, have they not got contiguous in there? Dear me. Oh, there it is. Contiguous. Ah, oh, yes. Um, so that's cool. So if we've got lots of uh, lots of 8-bit integers, it's going to be the first 8 bits, the next 8 bits, the next 8 bits, the next 8 bits. If it's 16 bits, 16, 16, 16, 16, and so on, uh, we can talk about that. And then we should also, um, we should do a simple thing where we... <sighs> I think we should just do a simple loop. Actually, this is quite a good place to do it after. We want to do it after with foreign objects. Because then we get to do this. We get to... Um, yeah, we can just do a loop then. Loop for i below 10. Do set f. Uh, mem a ref. Oops. Foo you int eight. Um, I to be i times ten. Oops. And I have not written CF of i again. I'll probably. We should probably actually do. We should probably make sure that um, on each video on the code section, because we normally have like code and REPL in all of those videos. Um, so we just have to go make sure um, so I'm trying to think it'd be kind of nice if we all have already had like use package um, like CFFI written. Um, Maybe we do that as the starting video. Maybe we, ah, oh, maybe we do split this out. Maybe we take this into its own video. It's kind of our intro. Um, yes. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this. We're gonna do um, series introduction. We're gonna do a big old welcome. We're going to do one line of what CFFI is. We're going to um, say that we're going to be working on a project and we'll show the package. Show the, um, actually, let's just show setting up the um, project. So yeah, quick project depends on blah 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 because that will only take a couple of seconds we've already got videos that have introduced that subject um, and that's really nice because it keeps it out of this and this can be totally focused now I like it okay that's the way we're going to do it and then we don't have to have CFFI everywhere um, Right. Um, so that's good. Let's see what's going on. There's some chatter here about different things. Um, Flubits can. Do, oh yeah. So Flubits is a pair programming thingy for syncing up a a directory or workspace live between IDEs running on different machines. Has a read-only mode in its web ID. Hey, Soding, the raid has arrived. Is it PHP? No, it is still not PHP. Um, yeah, it's a bit, of a bit of a weird video for you to come in on this one. So I'm not sure if you're like, I mean, you're welcome to hang around. But um, but yeah, we're, we're just doing some planning for a series of tutorials on the FFI for Common Lisp. So no pixels for you, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. So that's where we're at. So yes. What are we up to? What are we up to? So yeah, we're gonna have the 
let's just do um, let's go and set up the package actually now yes take new that's fine cool so we're gonna go and run through a loop which does that kind of stuff and then we can I suppose for the first video we're doing like stuff with arrays we're just going to do this like we can we can go and show that we were able to write um, some stuff into memory and then read it back again and they're the values we expected and it's basically an array or it is an array it's a foreign array um, And with that, we should then pretty quickly transition over to talking about um, the helpers that we have for working with arrays. Um, so one of them is obviously like with foreign array. Um, so we'll want to cover that pretty quickly. So we'll call it C array. Um, C, uh, yeah, let's do C array. Um, but this means that we have to address those um, array types so we'd have to do array um, and then you know int 32 and four of them that's interesting actually can you do um, any sized surely you can't do any sized array that would be rather bizarre so that will work, but this shouldn't work, does it? No. We kind of need, like, it should be able to just, it should, like, read the size of this first and then allocate this. It could definitely afford to do that. But then I suppose, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not ideal. Um, What's going on? Converting old code to PHP? Definitely. Always. That's all I do. Um, How to, <laughs> how to translate list to PHP 101. Yeah, I'm doing it very slowly. I'm doing it by writing lots of Lisp and no PHP. And then hopefully just like through the power of, you know, logic and reason, the world will guide me to writing PHP instead of this contorted mess. So yes, so basically what we'll do now is we'll... We could do a variant of this example. It's always nice when you can take an example from like... um. What am I trying to say? From video to video and evolve it. So what would we do? So what we, I suppose what we could do for this is we would do... Um, so let, yeah, let's do the first version. What we do loop for i below 4 and then Collect mem a ref um, c array in 32i, right? Whoops. Oh, yeah, I've still got that crap there, that's why. Good. So that will be the first example. And that's like a trivial evolution of, from where we were before. But. Well, that's, that's just a basic example. It would be nice to take the one we had. Did I just fucking delete the one I'm... Oh, for God's sake. Hold on. Yeah, that. Um, we're going to introduce with foreign array. We'll do this. And then we kind of want to recreate like a version of this, which would be something like... Let's just do let's um, list array be hmm what's the least janky way of doing this? Well, it's always going to be a bit janky, isn't it? So let's make an array. Let's just show we can do it anyway. Make an array of ten, um, ten things. We'll do the loop and we'll populate that array instead. So mem a ref doing this. And then with 
or an array. C array. We'll take the Lisp array and we'll tell it the type. Actually, it was 32, wasn't it, before? It's just int 32. And then we're just going to prove that we can read that back. So that's probably, I'm sure I cocked up something there, but foo is unbound. How dare you? Foo should always be bound. Well, foo is still unbound. Fuck you. Foo, where is it? Down here. Yep. There we go. Well, that's wrong. What did I do there? Oh yeah, I got the types wrong. That'll do it. Nice. Okay, cool. So that's the example that we're going to go with is just converting that so that the loop, the uh, array being passed in was just coming from Lisp. Um, when we're on the subject of this, there's one I really like. Um, Median saying, generally when you do things in the REPL, maybe just clear the REPL when there's a new segment or idea because it's nice to have a chance to really read what you've meticulously written. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's such a force of habit. Like, it, you're absolutely right. And I, um, I will try. I will try to do that. Um, that is just an unfortunate side effect of, yeah, how I'm thinking most of the time, which is like, yeah, do the thing. And then it's like, just, oh, okay, fine. We're done with that. Get on to the next shit. And done with that. Sorry. Habits. Good for nuns, bad for Chris. Right, let's have a look. Um, what time are we at? 21.43. Jesus, we got through that fast. There's a, this one I really like because it's just super cool. Um, with pointer to vector data. Um, ooh, pointer. Right. This can be really nice because if you already have an array. Um, okay, so I suppose we would need to distinguish. Oh, do we want to do this so soon? Um, let's see what the, the manual says about it. But I really like, I use this a lot in, in Capel um, to save copying and conversion and shit like that. Oh, it's not even documented. Really? That's like the best thing. Amazing. Okay, so if it's not even in the manual, I don't think I should mention it yet. But I don't know. I want to get to it eventually. This will be much later in the series, though. Because it is just one of the... Yeah, just being able to take a pointer directly to um, a Lisp array and pass it as is without any copying is wicked. And you can do that all the time, like with, um, yeah, so symbol unboxed array. Wow, can you actually check that? I wonder if that works. Um, let's do type P, symbol unboxed array. Do, 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 do. So nil. That's cool. So then we do make array. Um, 10 with element type being um, unsigned. Let's bring this down to a new line. Unsigned byte of that. Oops. And you really should put a thing there. Okay, so yes, stuff like that works. Um, same for. Fl oh. Really? Float doesn't work? That's interesting. Then I've got to do some testing because I do 
quite a bit of this, I think. With pointer to foreign data, where do I use that? Because it is possible that it's not actually been very efficient. Yeah, so I use it here. So I take an IVEC2, which is not defined right now, but that is a vector of two um, 32 bit ints in Lisp. And then we take a point to that. And that's been working fine which is quite scary if that's not correct. I mean, it's actually, I mean, this bit is all fine. It's just this declaration here, which really should be correct. Um, so with pinned objects, oh, that's interesting. So maybe I'm slightly outside of what um, SBCL says is valid. I will have to think about that. Um, hmm. Single float, single float. Good point. Oh, I'm an idiot as well. What the hell am I doing? So I typed float instead of float. And also, so this should have been single float anyway, which is then true. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I know, Chase. What the fuck? How was that allowed? Um, that is a good question. Why was that allowed? What am I talking about? Keyword? No. Element type. Um, yeah. Ooh, yeah, actually, that's very strange. The only way that should have worked... Uh, no, I, I have no idea, actually. What the fuck is this, then? Element type is T. It just allowed it and went to T. Array upgrading. Oh, I bet it's this. I bet it's a side effect of this. Um, nope. That doesn't like it, so... Yeah, that's a strange one. I'm surprised that didn't error. Let's have a look. Um, unless did SBCL optimize uh, actually making the array an inline a subtype check? I haven't. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Um, yes. So what do I want to say here? It would kind of be actually it would be nice to mention this early on because there's a certain balance between not not trying to swamp people with really complicated stuff but also impressing on people that this stuff is you know good because it was it was messing around with cffi that made me realize like oh yeah i'm i'm gonna be able to use like common list for graphics like for real because there were so many places where things got optimized to something that was very respectable for a dynamic language, you know? Stuff like, yeah, stuff got reduced down really well. So I'm not sure when I'm gonna introduce this, um, but we would have to, not upgrade it to type.
You know, it really would be nice to um, have a predicate that tells you if the thing that you're passing in is valid for this. Because this, yeah, this this is definitely a, a vector that is um, can be passed here, no doubt. I wonder what the other implementations do. We'd have to look into this because it would be actually quite nice to add a predicate here. Um, Work on SBCL, check the others. That's going to be a lot of work though, because like getting access to some of the implementations is a real pain. Um, but yes, okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff about arrays now. This might even be too much stuff in arrays. No, these are a few short videos. This isn't too bad. So let's go on to Deathstruct, because that's probably the next most interesting thing. Um, and it's a very natural kind of thing. We've talked about arrays. We've talked about basic types. Let's talk about um, other kinds of aggregations being structs. Um, see, I'm going to skip over def C type because as, as useful as it is, this is more like I feel is more useful up front. Like you can't. Uh, yeah, there are certain things you can't make easily without using def c struct. With def c type, you could use whatever type it is that you're aliasing. Um, okay, so there's really not too much to say, is there? We just need to show how to use def c struct. Um, let's see if there's any interesting points in there. We're just like, we've got, yeah, we've got names and we've got types. Um, name and options. What are the options? Right. Okay, so you can define conc name just like you can in in regular Lisp. Um, class, that comes later. That comes with, uh, okay, here we go. So by default, convert from foreign and also memref will make a plist with slot names as keys and convert to foreign will translate such a plist to the foreign structure. A user wishing to define other translations. So I, yeah, I guess should use the class argument def c struct and then define methods for translate from foreign and translate into foreign um, that specialize on this class, possibly calling call next method to translate blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. That's cool. That's interesting because I actually don't remember using class so much. The way I've got it, how have I got it set up in Capel? I've only got a few minutes left, but let's just bring up Capel. Do, do, do. Okay, so when we have def c struct, oh no, it's not def c struct, is it? It's uh, def struct g in Capel. I can't type anymore. It's foo, and we have, yeah, the different things. So, 
bar, which is an int, and baz, which is, you know, a um, bunch of floats. So we've got the def c struct here. Ah, so I do it in quite a fucky way. I define a C struct with a hidden name, and then I define a foreign type. Um, yeah, I define a foreign type with a parser, which lets me use this name instead of having to specify um, struct foo everywhere. I can just use foo. Um, blah, blah. I kind of don't want to get into that right away. Um, but yeah, you can see that the actual type here is a struct of this. Um, luckily, these simple parsers and stuff work fine. So if we, if we do this, um, that's struggling because we did it in the REPL, I think. That's interesting. Unless we've got a bug. Oh, now we just got loads of redefinitions everywhere. Let's just take this and go and look, because if we just found a bug, that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, no warnings. Okay, so it was just a REPL thing. Um, yeah, you can still use like foreign type size and everything uh, with foo, and it'll work. Um, actually, that's a good point, foreign type size. Hmm, where does that fit in? We should know about this pretty early because it really matters when we're talking about this stuff. Um, maybe we put it in this video. Or maybe we make another video just after here. Oops. U60 there. Sizes. Yeah, let's take foreign type size and just have a look at a few things. So, ah, there we go. So we'll go through a few of these and just show the obvious stuff that, yeah what people would expect. And the fact it's in bytes and stuff like this. That That's uh, that's appropriate. I don't wanna make, we could move sizes earlier, but then it's a bit too front heavy. It's nice to, yeah, get into this first and then we get to sizes as soon as possible. Um, all right, so. Yeah, let's not introduce these to begin with. Um, I think we can do conk name. Um, def c struct, def c struct conk name. We can do that as its own little quick video because that'll only take a minute. Um, what time? Oh, we're out of time. Balls. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'll stick around for another minute or so to answer those. But otherwise, I think we are done. Um, as you can see, we are getting an outline at least for how this course is going to start. It's going to be a good... I mean, to, to get to the point that we're dealing with uh, foreign libraries and stuff like this, it's going to be a good 20 or 30 episodes this will probably turn into. I think this is going to take at least another, like if this was two hours to get here, I think maybe another two or four hours, I could probably come up with most of the plan for the simple stuff. Um, and then I would have to sit down and really work on the complicated things. Um, but, but, but complicated stuff, I basically just mean stuff I don't know very well. <laughs> Um, most of the rest of it is actually, it's, it's all right, but we got to get, we, we really need a library, a tiny library that we can, that everyone can kind of run easily 
um, and that we can do tests with, so we can do some bindings for it. My candidate would probably be uh, one of the ones I've already wrapped because um, it's very simple. So I, I think, um, is it soil? Yeah, CL soil. Because um, I've already got um, libraries already, like binaries already made for Mac and Linux and Windows um, on 64 bit of all of those. So I think what we'll do is we'd take those and we would start writing bindings for that. And that's probably what the latter part of the course will be. So we'll go through all the basics and then we'll take those libraries, we'll copy them into the project and then we'll bring up the documentation um, and probably the C source as well because it's good to have that on hand. And then we can start making videos just on going through that. Um, I'm really glad you enjoyed this one, folks. This is one that I, yeah, I really wanted to work on this. It's really nice that it was, it was fun to watch. And Metian, how about JPEG Turbo? Um, I mean, could do. It, it just, the, the nice thing about Soil is I've got the binaries. It's very simple, and the documentation is good and bad enough that we can explore some things with it. Um, and yes, as Pom the Pimp's pointing out, remember next week we are starting one hour later, and that's how we're going to do from now on, unless I say otherwise. So from for Norway time, that's 9 to 11. All right, folks, I will stop now. Thanks so much for stopping by. I will catch you in a week. Peace.